Hello, this is the last of the sessions for our uh, Embedded Essentials track. Uh, we've had a bunch of really great talks so far, uh, starting with U-Boot, and we did debugging, we did um, a device tree, uh, SPI, I squared C, and we are finishing up with a great talk on spelunking hardware data. Uh, Matt Porter has been doing these, these style of talks and, and indeed uh, talks for a very long time across multiple conferences. And uh, we always like to finish up with a, um, a talk that sort of ties it all together. Uh, in this talk, uh, Matt is going to essentially be starting with uh, uh, a number of things and then walking down through uh, the, the schematic and, and, uh, and uh, the reference manuals and showing you how that stuff fits together, something that's a little bit mysterious to many people. Uh, in any case, on uh, that uh, note, Matt, take it away. All right. Um, thank you for the uh, uh, intro, Bahan, and and I, I want to thank all the uh, uh, the conference staff and the platform provider for working through a bunch of technical problems before this started, as as happens. So um, nothing seems to work as smoothly as we like <laughs> with all the different setups. So um, with that, um, we'll jump into things. Uh, I, what I want to um, first uh, um, discuss is that, you know, because of the change of, of the format, some of the um, some of the more ambitious uh, developing a device driver that we've done at the end of this track uh, in, in the past, um, not as easy to accomplish um, in the kind of group setting, hands-on on hardware. Um, so what we've uh, developed is a, a good portion uh, of um, that uh, tutorial was actually diving in and finding um, the hardware data to develop that driver. Um, so what we're going to do in this tutorial, and it's and it's really um, aimed at beginners, is to um, deep dive into hard how to extract that hardware data um, that you need to develop your um, your device driver. Um, so with, the, with that, a little bit of preliminaries. Um, my name is Matt Porter. Um, I'm the CTO at, at Consalco Group. Uh, I've been around in the Linux community uh, a long time. Um, I've been a kernel developer um, since the 90s, um, a contributor of various places. Um, and um, so uh, what I want to talk about is um, uh, also, uh, just to mention that, you know, Consulco Group, the company I work for, is a services company. Um, that's why I'm deeply intertwined with the Linux community and the kernel and so forth. We do a lot of um, training uh, with the Linux Foundation. Um, if you want more information, um, please see our website. <clears throat> so what are we going to do today? Um, since we're not going to write a device driver, um, it'll be fun to use some of the material that in past sessions where we were face to face, um, we deep dive on the bacon bits cape to find data and uh, make a paddle style joystick um, on that cape. It had a uh, it had a little thumb wheel and a button, and we made a joystick um, in past tutorials, and we actually um, you know, used on that hardware. And then um, when we moved to the Tech Lab cape. Um, uh, on the Pocket Beagle, uh, we had an accelerometer available uh, and some buttons. And so we used that to make a joystick. Uh, so I, I want to go through those examples um, by uh, uh, using those to kind of instruct in that process of how to kind of deep dive from, okay, I want to do this thing and I, I need to get the hardware data, but how do I go do that? Because the world of a modern system on a chip is very complex. Um, uh, if we do have, uh, you know, any any experience, folks in here, uh, those will probably you probably won't learn a whole lot here. I mean, we're very much tuned towards those beginners that maybe are just coming uh, into embedded Linux or haven't worked with um, uh, systems on a chip before. Maybe they're they're, they're full stack developers moving into embedded and, and, and need to know more. Uh, so um, we're, we're definitely um, uh, targeting those beginners. So we're gonna, we're gonna really focus on how to read the schematics for these platforms. We're going to focus on how to convert you know, entities on a schematic and trace them into a data sheet, and then how to get to device tree 
and turn it into device tree data because that's what feeds all our drivers when we're doing Linux kernel development. Um, and when we get done, uh, we want to practice our skills with some lab exercises and, and try to keep that flavor of a, of a hands-on tutorial a bit. Um, and I will uh, um, uh, uh, walk through those in, in a screen share type format, um, since that works better uh, than trying to do some interactive help uh, with everybody. So uh, with that, um, we're going to dive right into our first example. And so... Um, uh, one thing uh, I did um, did skip over is that you um, you will want to download these slides. Um, you may find you need to uh, refer back through them. I will tell you that they're uploaded on sked.org, um, so you can find a convenient link there. Um, they're also on the uh, el.org site, and there's a answered question already in the chat. If you don't know. Uh, where the link is. So a couple of places you can get those slides. And there's a lot of reference URLs and so forth in there that you may find um, useful as we move along. So let's take a look um, at the Bacon Bits hardware. Um, as, I, uh, as I mentioned, um, there's this handy little uh, thumb wheel uh, on the Bacon Bits board. Um, and just a quick, uh, quick shout out to Michael Welling who designed this board. It was really handy. Um, for making a simple little joystick. Um, he's another instructor. He did the uh, I2C and SPY uh, tutorial just before this. Um, but this is his design. And so what I've done here is I've highlighted, um, we're looking at the board, okay, I want to make a joystick out of this thumb wheel, kind of like an old paddle controller, um, and then that user button you see. Um, so um, we know it's on the silk screen that RV1 is the thumb, thumb wheel device. Let's keep that in mind as we go to our schematic. And you'll note there's a, there's a pointer. If you want to pull out the schematic and look at it locally, um, you can do so. Um, as I mentioned, it's easier to do that as I move forward if you have those slides locally. Um, so just a top level view here. Um, we're looking at, um, in the upper bubble, uh, the headers of the, um, the bacon bits board that attach to the pocket beagle, okay? Um, and then I highlight the user button and the thumb wheel area. So let's take a close look at those. Um, so first, the, the thumb wheel, RV1, as we noticed from the silk, silk screen. So, so to find that, we were able to look and say, oh, okay, that RV1 thing is our, is our thumb wheel. So if I just look at that little piece, um, I can quickly pull out these, these nicely labeled sing signals, right? ADC ground, ADC power, and analog in, okay? And uh, we're going we're gonna to save that knowledge for later. Um, so that's, that's important there. Um, and if we go and we take um, uh, the the pocket beagle uh, pinout. And you might, you might be able to see this better uh, on, your own, um, on your own display, uh, depending on how far you can zoom in. Uh, but what you can trace to uh, is that if you look at this pocket beagle pinout, okay, um, you'll find that there's uh, corresponding analog input uh, pins. And uh, so uh, what I want to what I want to point out is in the yellow um, on the left side you'll see AIN 1.8 volt right um, there's a there's a reference and then there's various channels okay is what this is pointing out and they, you can see the corresponding uh, uh, pin number on the header um, so these are the very ubiquitous pin numbers. Um, for the pocket beagle pinout on the P1 and P2 connectors, but on that P1 connector starting at number 17, right, and the odd number up to 27, you see a bank up to four, and then you'll see some other, um, those are all the 1.8 volt referenced um, analog inputs, and then you'll see in yellow, you'll see some other analog input channels, right, um, which are the, the five, six, and seven, so there's eight channels total. Um, okay. So uh, we saw uh, uh, up to this point uh, that uh, we had this, this analog input into this thumb wheel, which tells us it's using an ADC. Um, we know that there's various channels here 
uh, of the um, of the analog input pins on these these headers. And so uh, we can see that from that that the thumb wheel is connected to analog input zero, right? That's AIN zero. And then um, we can also see uh, that the user button in the user portion of the, uh, the schematic uh, or the button portion is uh, connected to GPMC 8013, okay? Um, And uh, apologies there. Um, I did skip over a slide where I, I didn't show that. <laughs> Just realized that. Um, and so um, in that in that schematic, um, if you had had that up locally and focused in on that spot um, back here on this slide ten, um, you can easily see on the connector these signals that we identified uh, and what pins they go to. All right. So when we the the P one nineteen, okay that it's attached to, we use that information to go to the pocket beagle pinout and see that P119 is that AIN zero. Okay. Um, so that's how we got which analog input uh, it was connected to. All right. So if we wanted to um, uh, create uh, a set of device tree data, um, to make use of this data, um, um, this, this general hardware data we've collected, right? Uh, we can summarize what we found as, uh, well, my user button is connected to this GPMC 8013 pin. And so I need to, to mux that as GPIO 113. Um, and the best way, if I, if I go back uh, and really point this out, um, our GPIO 13 on, if you look at um, the white uh, areas in the pocket beagle pinout, you'll see the GPIOs uh, laid out. And so GPIO 13 is on the left, it's P128. Okay. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to jump back up the slide. I just wanted to focus on that. Um, so that's how we knew it was GPIO 113. Um, and uh, so uh, what we have to do is we have to specify in our um, device tree data um, where that GPIO is that we want to use in our joystick um, driver uh, and also what analog channel we need to read. Okay. And uh, so in order to do that, uh, if we're if we're uh, wondering uh, how do we pin mux a, a GPIO, uh, we may need to dive into the, um, the, the TRM, the Technical Reference Manual for the AM335X parts. Uh, we find that uh, GPIO 1, um, <clears throat> 113 is at offset 834. You'll see I have it highlighted there. Also note it's the GPMC 8013 pin, so that confirms what we what we saw. <clears throat> um, okay, so we have that data on the GPIO and which one it is and where that goes. But we need to know a little bit more if we're making a joystick driver and we're using um, a thumb wheel attached to a um, uh, an analog digital converter, then it will fall under the purview of the IIO subsystem. And in past presentations, we, we've deep dived in the IIO subsystem, uh, but in, in the big picture, what you do need to know is um, it provides an umbrella framework for um, uh, devices that are either DACs or ADCs to provide data to different consumers. And often the consumer people use it in user space to just read out um, data from SysFS or um, uh, through uh, some efficient uh, ring buffer mechanisms. Um, but you can also uh, be a consumer in kernel, kernel space for say a driver. Uh, so the first thing we wanna look at is that 
Um, there's this concept of, of device tree and, and, and really a shout out to, to Skylar Patton. And I know that um, at least um, um, uh, Mike Welling also has, has covered device tree in, in his talk. Uh, one of the, the, um, the patterns you see or idioms uh, is the uh, provider consumer type model. And that, that really um, permeates all of the uh, subsystems in the kernel, and then likewise the model of the device tree bindings. So when we see provider or consumer throughout them, just to remember the provider in our case is we've got an ADC, this raw ADC driver, and it's providing samples to somebody, right? Um, so uh, there, there's going to be this provider, uh, and that's the actual analog digital converter. Uh, in our case, it's something that's on the um, the, the, the TIAM 335X um, SOC. Um, so enough on that. What's really interesting to us as we um, develop our driver uh, is the consumer binding. And what you'll see here is that, um, and, and you can refer to this um, yourself if you have a, a kernel tree uh, handy, uh, that uh, you can go see the required properties. If I'm developing a consumer driver, something that act, act, is actually consuming samples from an ADC in order to um, perform some function. So in my case, my joystick, I need to constantly consume samples from this thumb wheel, right? And um, so I'm gonna be monitoring a, a channel on that ADC. Uh, so I'm going to have to pass it which channel to use, right? Um, there may be multiple ADCs on the system. So I have to give, um, as it specifies in the, this binding, um, a, a P handle and IIO specifier pair. Um, so keep that in mind. And one nice thing about the binding documents is they give you an example. And, um, uh, you know, if you, you've seen the other um, uh, presentations, uh, tutorials, you'll find the syntax becoming a little bit familiar. Um, but you see in the example in the binding, you know, uh, they specify IO, IO channels um, that they're using for some device like our joystick. And um, they specify uh, ampersand ADC, uh, which would be a P handle, and then one which you know typically um, um, zero base. That would be the second channel of that analog di digital converter. All right, um, and just a little bit more detail. If we were to look at the binding for the um, the ADC that's found on the TIAM335X uh, part, we would jump into this binding, which is referenced there in the kernel tree. And you can see that um, what this tells us, is just confirms that if we have um, analog input zero, and as you recall, that's the analog input that we, we traced our thumb wheel to be attached to, then the actual channel number is going to be zero. So it's lines up, it's it's one to one right, channel, um, the, the hardware channel to what value we would pass in. <clears throat> okay, um, finally, uh, there's um, uh, bindings for uh, pin control. Um, just a reminder of where you can find those. I try to cite each thing so you can go in and see. And the way those are used, so say we're making our joystick device, well, we're going to need to um, tell the GPIO, right, um, or tell the pin control driver how to set that GPIO or that pin such that it behaves as a GPIO or, or uh, provides that signal. So um, the example here is, is pretty illustrative. You'll see this pattern um, throughout DTS files where you see um, a device and um, um, uh, pin control names and then which pin control, um, pin control zero and what state it's using. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll show an example of that uh, here at the end. Um, and then uh, the next piece, and we've got a lot of pieces, right? We've got our ADC, we've got our GPIO for the button, we've got to mux it with the pin control binding, right? And so, so in order to get this GPIO so that we can read it in our driver, um, if, if we want to uh, uh, provide that GPIO data, 
Um, if we look at this GPIO binding that I show here, uh, our, our node or our, de our device node um, for our driver, um, we will need to um, have something like this enable GPIOs, right? Um, so if I have a, a button dash GPIOs, um, then I can refer to a button within the driver um, to get that resource. And so you'll see the same pattern of a specifier here. So this in this example, um, if I had um, um, a GPIO1 um, uh, p-handle to a, a bank of GPIOs, I could say ampersand GPIO. Um, in this case, it's, it's QE, QE, PIOE, and then 18 would be the GPIO line within that GPIO bank, right? And then a flag as to uh, whether it's active high or low um, is, is a pretty um, common uh, paradigm here. All right, so that covers the GPIO uh, consumption uh, binding. And so let's, let's just look at an implementation using all this data we've gathered up. Now, um, in this first example, I use... Um, I use the mainline kernels am335x pocketbeagle.dts. Um, and if I were adding in support for this, um, what I call a paddle um, joystick, reminds me of Atari 2600 days, uh, then um, I, would, I would define, okay, I have first, I have to have a node to define the um, pin mux um, node um, and that uses on, on TIAM335X, it uses the pin control single driver. And so we have this node here um, where I, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, give it a label, GPI113 pin. Um, I specify the pin control single pins. And then as you recall, we went and we looked up what the raw offset was to that pin that contains the GPIO 113 function. So GPIO 1 and the offset, it's the 13th GPIO within that bank, right? We looked that up in the data sheet in an earlier slide, right? Um, and we saw it was offset 834. That's why we put that magic value in there. Uh, and then there's some flags. Um, we're using it as an input, so we need to uh, mux it to be a, a pin input, uh, mux mode 7. Um, which is the, the um, <clears throat> GPIO mode. Um, so that stuff, you actually have to look in the, the code for uh, the, um, the definitions. Um, there's a number uh, in, a, in the header files, there's a number of uh, definitions for these modes, um, the pin input and then the, the TI specific MUX modes. Uh, but that's, that's how we put all that data in that, that piece. Then the meat of this is this paddle node Right. And so we define a compatible. Um, uh, that's not our most important part, but you notice we use exactly the guidance in the, um, the device tree binding documentation that we saw in previous slides. And so we set pin control zero, which if we read the whole binding is the default um, MUX state um, once this driver is initialized. Um, so so that's, that's a, a little subtle thing, but it's well, well documented in the, the device tree binding docs. And we, we give it the P handle to our little pin mux node that we created, which will mux this as that GPIO 113, okay? Um, next, uh, we set I, IO channels, okay? And IO channels name. We wanna give, give a human readable name um, to the channel that represents our thumb wheel and our driver. And so when we, when we use the IIO APIs, the in-kernel APIs, we can reference thumb wheel by name um, to, uh, to claim that channel uh, and start reading uh, samples from it. Uh, but the, the important piece is that we did identify that the channel zero or this, this zero in IO, or IO channels, excuse me, is the AIN zero, right, channel that we identified all the way back to our schematic, um, top level schematic is attached to that thumb wheel. Um, finally, we have to use that same uh, paradigm from that GPIO consumer binding, 
right, where I mentioned we'll, we'll use button GPIOs. So you can see we specify ampersand GPIO 1, 13, right? So that's our GPIO 1, 1.13 or underscore 13 GPIO, and then um, it's going to be active low. Um, and, uh, well, why is it active low? If we look at the schematic, you'll see, um, you'll see that it's, it's got a pull up on it. Something we glossed over there. <clears throat> All right. So that's our, that's our first example. Um, now I want to show what we've been working on. Um, and you can see how yeah, I use the term spelunking because it just feels like you're, you're drilling down into these different data sheets and different sources of information, right? We've had to touch, gosh, you know, how many uh, device tree binding docs to see the format of this. And then we had to, um, we had to uh, potentially look at the TRM to understand how the uh, ADC uh, channels are laid out. Um, and and uh, the other binding that told us um, the, the TI specific one for how the AIN numbers map out um, because certain things don't map out one to one like that. You may need to uh, dive into the, the technical reference manual. So let's look at a, a, a different, um, similar, um, but, but different hardware um, with an accelerometer um, that we've been uh, teaching uh, driver development on uh, in this tutorial. And so that's the Tech Lab CAPE. And so that's the thing we've been using, um, uh, the CAPE we've been using, very similar. So we're still working with our pocket beagle. And so uh, if you had a Tech Lab CAPE in front of you, that's what it would look for, or look like, excuse me. Um, you'll see there's a, a buttons there left and right, kind of a little bit more designed to, to be used as a sort of game controller. Uh, and then there's an accelerometer uh, right above that on the silk screen that, that you can kind of see labeled the axes are labeled there. Uh, so that's, that's what it looks like if you had one in your hand. Um, so um, again, uh, what we've tried to do, you know, or what we've done face to face is we actually write the driver after we gather this data. And, and of course, at the end, we play Tetris using our joystick driver. Uh, not going to do that today. Um, but we're going to go through the same exercise and make a joystick out of this accelerometer. But, but what we're, what we're going to focus on is how do we get the data to feed into that driver if we're going to write it. Right. So again, we start at our top level. And so I show the, the uh, full size um, blow up of the Tech Lab Cape. Um, again, feel free, um, download this. You can look at it full screen um, there at home. And uh, so what I do is I, again, uh, take the approach of highlighting each of the important areas. Right. So starting uh, left to right from the top, we've got our Pocket Beagle headers where the the Tech Lab Cape uh, mates with the Pocket Beagle. Uh, and then uh, below, uh, uh, midpoint on the right, uh, we have the uh, accelerometer. Okay. And then finally, those two buttons on the lower uh, right uh, that are highlighted. So let's look at each of those in detail and start gathering our data. So first, the idea here, if I didn't make it clear, is we're making it, we're making a joystick all right. Our purpose here is to make a joystick so that we can just tilt the board and play a game, right? Um, and use the buttons, right? Um, so we're going to use the accelerometer to control our axes on the uh, on the uh, joystick. So given that, um, so this accelerometer, if we deep dive into this uh, this section of the schematic. Um, You'll note um, it's pretty clear, and you know, often on the schematics, they'll even tell us explicitly um, what the I2C address is for something like this, so that we 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 see without even knowing a whole lot about. And we don't even have to look at this data sheet, and we say, okay, it's an I2C accelerometer, like many of them. Um, and what's important out of this is that it, is we can see right from the signal names that um, it's connected the the SCL uh, again. Hopefully you went to Michael Welling's I2C talk and these signal names will now mean something. Um, so SCL is P1.28 and SDA is P1.26. And it tells you right up front that it's at I2C address 0x1C. So great. Um, this schematic tells us a whole lot without having to look and 
go much further here, right? Um, so that's fine. Um, if I want to uh, see what that looks like, uh, then, uh, for example, I can go down to P126 um, uh, uh, and 128. So again, look at your pocket beagle pinout. I repeat it here. And if you go down that column of even numbers on P1 and 26, you'll see the way the way that the way this um, this pinout diagram is laid out. I find it easy for for people to refer to. Hopefully you do as well. Uh, you'll see that it points out there in in purple or whatever you want to call that color uh, that uh, SDA SCL um, is I two C two. Um, so very easy to see how those are connected. Um, so we we know a lot just from that piece of the schematic. Um, we already talked in the, I want to repeat here just um, we talked in the, the previous section about the IIO provider binding, um, the consumer binding and so forth. But just for your reference, again, we're going to, um, in the case of an accelerometer, IIO um, uh, is also the umbrella framework. An accelerometer is just a purpose built ADC. Right. Um, so everything is, is, you know, that's a sensor is essentially an analog digital converter. Just some of them provide, um, you know, purpose built uh, type um, uh, sensor data. Right. Like like an accelerometer. Uh, so, again, we fall under that purview. Um, there is a um, driver for this particular accelerometer uh, already. So it would have a provider binding, but we're going to write this joystick where we're a consumer again. So we're gonna have that same model in our data that we saw with that thumb wheel driver because we have these nice frameworks and a, and a generic binding like this. Um, we, can, we can make a joystick that accesses this accelerometer just as easy as it can the thumb wheel. Uh, same thing, um, don't need to really gloss over, or I can gloss over this GPO consumer binding because now we have two buttons instead of just one. Uh, we're just going to have to define two buttons. No big deal, right? So um, we saw that. Um, so in order to describe uh, the uh, in order to describe the joystick hardware, uh, we are going to um, whoops. Sorry, I skipped over a couple slides again. New to this interface. <laughs> All right. Um, great. So we saw that um, um, GPIO binding, and then I skipped over these. So what I want to show you is if, in this case, I'm using the BeagleBoard.org, um, the, the downstream kernel, um, DTS file. And so it's a little bit different um, from mainline. Um, they are doing some work to, to make them the same. Um, that's ongoing. But uh, one of the nice things is it in the, the Bone Pinmux helper, um, it does make some of these things very clear um, of how that pin can be muxed. And we know that uh, in the case of our uh, buttons, um, that uh, our P129, we can see how to set that as a GPIO input. You'll see um, P, pin control four uh, is in this is uh, the P129 GPIO input. So if we wanted to set it that way, we would use that, um, that option. Uh, <clears throat> and then the same thing, the other button uh, uh, we found was uh, connected to the P233 mode, and if we want to set that to GPIO input again, it's it's the pin control four um, node. So one of the uh, one of the interesting things here um, is that if we look at um, the P129 uh, GPIO resource. Uh, we can see that uh, this pin, if we look into the data sheet, right, on the ZCC uh, form factor, we look at GPIO 321, uh, and uh, 
we can see that uh, to set it into that mode, we have to select mode seven. Okay. And same thing, our GPMC 8013 ZCC package, um, and that corresponds to the GPI 1.13 pin on Pocket Beagle. Uh, in order to set that, we're going to have to mux this um, into mode 7. So it has all these other options um, that it can be muxed as. <clears throat> so how do we describe um, this joystick hardware? Um, we're going to um, specify the the um, that we're going to use this accelerometer and uh, let me uh, jump back here because one of the things that we did skip over um, since I'm really bad at this new interface for going through the slides is that um, if I looked in at the MMA 8453 data sheet, which can be found here um, at this URL that I cite. Um, one of the things I need to know if I'm writing a driver, just FYI, is that I need to know um, uh, what type of samples, right, this accelerometer uh, produces. Because if I'm consuming samples from it, I need to know what the driver um, provides. Uh, and uh, not many drivers in uh, IIO provider drivers actually uh, communicate their uh, resolution um, through the in-kernel consumer um, uh, interface. There is provision to allow it, but very few provider drivers actually provide that information. Um, so uh, what, what you have to do here is actually read the data sheet, find out, okay, it generates 10-bit data samples. There is an option for 8-bit, but if we actually look at the MMA 8452.c kernel driver, we can easily see that it's it's hard-coded into 10-bit sample mode. Um, and so, uh, and then this explains, this whole section explains uh, 2G mode um, means, uh, uh, and, and that's what it's in in the driver, is that our range is negative 255 to 256. So if we we're writing a driver, we'd use that. We're not going to you know, reflect that at all in the device tree data that we produce. But it's a good thing to keep in mind that there's other aspects of things that aren't always reflected in the device tree data that you may need to hard code in that consumer driver of yours. Um, so that's, that's one, uh, in fact. Um, in which you, you'd have to do that. Um, so um, just to, to review again, we, uh, we found um, in, in our, in our um, uh, review, and I want to jump back to the GPIO buttons. Da, 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 there we go. Okay. Um, if we look at the, the Tech Lab buttons, and again, another slide I skipped over, but we can we can go back and forth till I get it right. Um, so if we we zoom in on the buttons here, right, uh, we see uh, one. We see we've got pull up resistors, right. Um, so that's telling us first that these are active low. Um, so we do need to know some basic electronics to to understand how how buttons work. Um, but it tells us on the tech lab schematic very clearly what signals hooked up. Um, so we know that the right button, physical button, is our P129, um, P2.33. Um, and uh, as I pointed out, if we jump over to the pinout, you can clearly see where those, uh, what, what GPIOs those correspond to. So um, let's, go, let's go back here. So P129 right, is our right button. And if we jump to our, our pinout and we look very closely at this, um, we, see, uh, we see which GPIO that is. And of course, on this pinout diagram, uh, it is, it is um, the P129. Uh, it's using a number 117, uh, which there's, we just have to know there's 32 GPIOs per bank. Um, so um, there's many GPIO banks uh, on the uh, the TIAM335X part. 
Um, so we can actually uh, do a little math and see which one that is, <clears throat> uh, which bank, and then which offset within it. All right. So um, I'll jump through these guys here. All right. Now. All right, so now um, let's talk about our implementation. So say we, um, uh, we want to uh, define this joystick, um, we gather all that data we pulled together, right? Um, so first off, there's, there's some boilerplate where we have to specify the address cells in use um, when we um, modify and add a, a node into the I2C2 controller. So first off, um, First off, we, uh, uh, we identified that, remember, all the way back on the top level schematic and then looking at the, the BeagleBoard pinout, right, that the accelerometer is, is hooked to I2, the I2C2 controller, right? So it, it said SDA, SCL, SCL2. Um, so it's hooked to that second one. And so this is one-to-one. -one. So we overlay that. Um, we modify the I2C2 uh, node and we add a <clears throat> MMA8453 device. Uh, and um, part of what we do um, in, in the syntax, and all of this is generic device tree. So we say at 1C, that's the address at which this device is found on that I2C2 bus, right? But we also, um, the last, we show the property last, we also have to set the reg property, okay? Um, and so this is generic register access device tree. Uh.
Thank you. You will now be placed into conference. Okay. Um, we're back now with um, alternate audio, um, and I'll just make a quick modification so this works okay. <laughs> All right, so sorry about the technical difficulty. Um, uh, we're back with audio now uh, only uh, in the slides. And uh, so um, uh, the implementation here, as I was saying, um, probably uh, I'll just start at the top there. So we knew it was the, um, the second I2C bus, uh, so we modify that node. Um, we add the uh, MMA8453 node. Um, we know it's uh, address uh, 1C, um, so we have to have uh, register 1C. We got that off the, the schematic. <clears throat> and uh, and um, then we set it to, to OK. So all of this is uh, basically boilerplate just to enable that um, I2C device at that address um, um, on the I2C bus. Um, that way that that standard driver um, that's already in the kernel will initialize. So that's our I2, that's our IIO uh, provider driver. <clears throat> so then um, <clears throat> we need to, uh, well, at least on the, the, the BeagleBone um, kernel, we, we disable um, some of the generic capes and so forth. All of that um, kind of boilerplate there. The important piece that we have is our joystick node. Um, so we invent a compatible name for our uh, special device. And then uh, we set our, our pin control zero uh, to those GPIO input pin um, P handles that I uh, mentioned in an earlier slide. So we looked at those special um, bone pin, pin mups helper nodes, and so those are useful. So those correspond to uh, pin mux the um, left and right button into GPIO input mode, which corresponds to, to mode, mode 7 on the actual pin mux hardware in the chip. Uh, we need, uh, in this driver, we have a couple uh, axes available. So we have something that's a little bit more complex uh, than the um, the bacon bits uh, thumb wheel cape, that was a, a single axis, right, uh, uh, joystick. In this case, we have we have dual axes. We have an X and a Y. So we define a channel for each of those. Uh, so the MMA8453, uh, we're going to use channel channel zero is our X, uh, channel one is our Y, and we name those so that we can. Uh, easily make use of them in our driver um, when we claim those IIO um, channels. And then similar, um, since we have an extra button, now we have to pass uh, both of the, um, the P handle and, and specifier pairs um, for both of our buttons. So previously we had one button in our other example, now we have two. Um, remember they're both active low, we saw those pull up resistors and we had we uh, you know we're able to trace that those are, are GPIO 321, right, and GPIO 113, and we get those values by just looking at the GPIO number on that BeagleBone um, Pocket Beagle, <coughs> excuse me, the Pocket Beagle um, um, pin diagram, right, pin out. Okay, so I have a I have a couple labs, and we'll see if we can uh, make the uh, see if we can make the screen share uh, work, even though we're having some uh, connection issues. And to go through these labs, 
uh, I recommend, um, and again, hopefully you have these these slides pulled down. Um, you wanna you wanna um, you wanna go through these labs yourself. Um, do this exercise to practice um, these on your own. Um, these resources, if you want to grab these PDF files, the Tech Lab Cape, um, the uh, the data sheet, the AM3352 data sheet, um, and you you the other ones you can just bring up in a <clears throat> in a browser and take a look at if you like. Um, so those are useful in in any of these labs. Uh, the first one is um, so we went through a pretty complex example, and all I want to do is encourage people to go try to um, find the right GPIO, um, or excuse me, uh, on the um, the light sensor. Let's just say um, find the hardware signals it uses. Uh, I already tell you that you're going to express uh, this in terms of ADC channels, so you know it's using an ADC channel uh, on here. Um, so um, go ahead and, and get started with that. Uh, I will see if I can screen share, and the idea for me is to, to walk through this um, so that you can see it yourselves. Okay. Um, we may not be able to do the screen share due to some um, connection issues. Uh, so <clears throat> What I'll encourage you to do is um, we'll walk through it kind of verbally <laughs> uh, on these. And so if you look at your uh, you look at your your tech lab uh, schematic and find the light sensor, um, this is a pretty easy one. Uh, so it's very similar to our first exercise. Um, so you'll trace. Find that at the bottom of sheet one. You'll see on the, the Tech Lab cape, it's uh, connected to P119. And it tells you right up front that's AIN0. So this is a pretty easy exercise if you recall the, um, the IO dash channels um, property that we've used in the, the two examples. Um, you end up uh, having the the same expression um, uh, of IO channels uh, as you have for the original Bacon Bits uh, thumb wheel uh, ADC channel. Um, so um, so that one's pretty straightforward. Hmm. Now the the next one in Lab Two. Uh, we go through that. Um, you <clears throat> you need to find the buzzer on the Tech Lab uh, cape thing, and shouldn't be too hard to find that it's in the the bottom right there. And when you find that, um, you'll notice the 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 signal there. So, kind of walking you through this, um, you'll see um, a transistor. And you'll see a signal um, that that's uh, fed into the base of that transistor, right? 
and um, so that's what's that's what's controlling um, this buzzer, right? And it's labeled P2.30, right? PRU0.3 buzzer. Uh, so <clears throat> you can use that information, and you walk uh, back to your um, your handy <clears throat> your handy um, pinout uh, that we have a couple places in the slide deck. And so if you go back to that, which I have to go back to as well, <laughs> um, and we know it's P2.30, right? Um, so what you can see is that's a um, GPIO. Right, so you notice that first bank. So you're looking at the right side of that pocket beagle pinout. If you brought that up, your reference, right, and um, you uh, you see in in white um, it lists GPIOs. So that's 113. All right. And so finally from that you can uh you can express that um GPIO uh in device tree format. Um so you want to uh, uh use the same format uh that we did uh, with the buttons GPIO or button GPIOs and express it as a as a an, an ampersand GPIO some node and then an offset right And so since there's, uh, the hint here is since there's 32 GPIOs per bank, um, starting with the GPIO zero, zero bank, right? Um, <clears throat> so GPIO three, the, the offset zero would be um, GPIO number 96, the way this pocket beagle pinout is. So you're going to get the offset by by taking the difference from that number. So just it's kind of a shortcut way to get that GPIO value. Okay, and then um, I see there's a I see there's a number of uh, questions coming up, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna jump into lab three and then start answering those. So um, the last one's a little bit more challenging. Um, so this is um, we haven't talked about PWMs, so that's kind of using your own discovery um, ability here. Uh, and uh, so, so find that Tech Lab multicolored LED um, on that top level schematic. Um, and, um, and then let's, let's document what hardware signals it uses for each of the RGB. Um, 
So it's got a, a the, the way these work is it's got a, a PWM for each of red, green, and blue. And you can kind of, you can see that. There is a, do note that the topmost signal, um, the green alt um, is, is a DNP, so that's do not populate, right? So that's, uh, that can be ignored. Um, and uh, you can kind of uh, you can kind of see you can see what pins are involved here, but it will take a little bit of work to get at what the right um, what the right uh, device tree nodes are for those. Um, and uh, one one thing you may need to do is jump into the or you will need to do is um, make use of the um, uh, technical reference manual uh, for these. And if you've downloaded the slides that I actually have updated um, this slide to reflect that. Um, uh, and, and of course it's in the, uh, the set of links that you should uh, um, download in the, the updated uh, slides that were available in PDF format. So if you go to the um, if you go to, to, to the um, enhanced PWM section of the PWM chapter in the technical reference manual, so that's the SPRUH. And a diagram that shows you how each instance of the enhanced PWM uh, peripheral is laid out, and so there's a channel A and B uh, of each, and so that's why you'll see that's why you see signals here uh, labeled as PWM 1A, PWM 0A. So 0 and 1 are different um, enhanced PWM instances, and the A and B are different channels. Um, so it's only really uh, clear uh, once you. Uh, uh, are able to, to delve into the TRM. Uh, so you'll need to look at that, uh, the binding docs that I referenced, um, and also that TRM. And the idea here is to e express these three, um, the RG and B PWMs in the form of um, a P handle and specifier, uh, much like the examples in the, the PWM binding documentation. Okay. Um, so I see. Uh, I did have. Um, <clears throat> one one person found that apparently I pasted in the wrong um, uh, the wrong URL for the TRM. Um, uh, so sorry about that. Um, Okay, uh, and and uh, okay. The next one, um, I have a question uh, as to what is the definition of a consumer and provider in the kernel? Do you have an example of a consumer driver and a provider driver? Uh, so let me let me uh, give give my my best example. There is is really uh, well. There's so many of them. So those so I'm, I'm racking my brain. But but what we're doing here is a is a great example, right? So um, if if we were to take this to conclusion, like we've done in face to face uh, labs, so um, a in a Linux input driver. Uh, or a joystick, and a joystick is simply just a, um, a fancy analog di digital converter, right? So a provider driver in the kernel would be this analog digital converter driver, right? So in our case, it's the TI, um, AD, the TS ADC driver. That's a provide. That's an IIO provider driver, right? And then if we wrote 
this driver that we keep alluding to. It would be a Linux input subsystem driver, uh, which then consumes is a, a it's actually an IIO consumer, right? Um, and there's there's an internal API uh, or internal it's a kernel internal API for in kernel consumers of IIO providers. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Michael Anderson says hard coded. Say it ain't so. <laughs> Nobody hard codes. Um, yeah. So um, you know, let me let me go back to that and, and why I said that. Uh, so uh, if if we wanted to um, write this driver and not hard code, um, and and this is going back to that original example, or well, the actually the, the tech lab example where uh, the IIO in kernel API, um, the, the provider drivers have the ability to provide a resolution. We could have modified the TS80 or not the TS, the MMA 8453 to report its resolution. And also, if I remember correctly, the in kernel API, at least at the time I looked, the, the, the IO consumer API, didn't have the ability to access that resolution information yet. Um, it may now, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and so that's why, at least for the purposes of a, a tutorial driver, we just hard coded that range. Um, so yeah, um, to, to Mike's point, um, there's always a way to do this better and programmatically, right? Where we could just um, grab that range um, that we had to go um, figure out. Um, it, Certainly, uh, certainly the framework is just about there for it. Um, so, I, I will, uh, Mike, I will tell you, uh, Patch is welcome. <clears throat> okay. I think that was all the questions. Um, do the connection problems, it's uh, uh, difficult for me to screen share and kind of um, show the uh, the solutions for these. Uh, but I, hopefully walking through them by voice uh, helps, you know, illustrate um, how we uh, how we dive in and get that information. <clears throat> Are there uh, any questions uh, on the material or the, the lab exercises? So, how we got the data. Okay. Well, we still have some time, so I if uh, people are going, you know, trying to to figure out the PWM one, I'm I'm more than happy to <clears throat> answer questions of how that's done. Matt, are there any uh, are there any uh, uh, demos you can show with your? Uh, I guess you got the, the phone to your ear. Oh, you've got my uh, video again, huh? <laughs> well, let's see. All right. Ian, can you hear me okay? 
I can, yes. Yeah, to, to answer the question, uh, I do not think that uh, uh, due to the connection problems, I can screen share anything reliably. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> well, the other thing we can do is we could um, uh, we could set up a Slack channel if people want to ask questions as well. Oh, there you go. There's a screen share. Is it working? Well, that's good. All right. I can no. see your I can see the, the schematic. Okay. Hold on a second. Tell me if you can hear me okay in a second and I'll drive through this. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, good. All right, so so let's uh Let's try it through. Looks like the connection problems are, are kind of solved now. Uh, and so <clears throat> the, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the important things here are these three, P21, P133, and uh, the P136 uh, PWMs. And so uh, the first thing, the first thing I mentioned about this is that it's if you go and um, you want to dive more deeply into this, right, then you have a situation where uh, you want to, we'll just go through my local copy of a slide. So P133, um, we see that that's uh, PWM zero, B, okay, um, and then let me, this is how it's supposed to go. Uh, so that core, that P133 corresponds here. All right. So I could I could note, okay, PWM zero B. That's great. Now that one, you notice that when I when I look at this, it didn't tell me PWM zero B. I had to go. I have to go to this this diagram here to get that information right off of P133. The other two signals, uh, if I I like to flip back and forth between P136, they told you on the schematic it's PWM 0A, right? Um, so what we're what what we don't know, right? When we if we're not familiar with this hardware, is exactly how those translate into device tree data, right? So the way I would do it is, okay, I don't really understand this. So I'm going to uh, bring up the, the TRM. And okay, let me, let me not cheat here. Uh, I'm just gonna flip through uh, and find the PWM subsystem. And I'm gonna jump down to the enhanced EPWM mo module, right? And I'm going to skim through this because I'm impatient. Um, but they do tell me in the introduction section that the XA and, and XB, right, refer to output signals from the EPWM X instance. So right off the bat, it starts clearing up how things are organized, right? Because I'm seeing this stuff on the schematic and you know, thus it points out that EPWM one A and one B belong to the EPWM one instance, right? So on. Okay, great. Um, maybe I'm not 100% clear on that. So this diagram in Figure 1517 kind of clarifies it very, very carefully for me. So now, how does that correspond to what we learned? Well, we know, um, you know, if we took some good notes that um, the, uh, the red, the, the uh, red uh, input uh, is the PWM 0B, uh, the blue 
input uh, is PWM 0A, okay? Um, so that's what you see in that diagram there. <clears throat> and then G is PWM 1A. Now, two of those, the schematic told us explicitly, um, and, and one of them, we had to go look at that uh, diagram just because of the way the, the, the uh, designer chose to, to label the signals. Um, it wasn't um, abundantly clear just from that. So great. Um, so now, if I wanted to go look at um, uh, how this maps out, I know that that I'm going to use the first instance or the zeroth instance, so the first one we'll call it, um, and I'm going to use channels A and B, right? And so one way I can get the information I want uh, out of this is, as I mentioned, <clears throat> you can look at the the. Um, let me let me expand this so it's a little bit <clears throat> more visible here. Uh, uh, you can look at the PWM binding. Um, we notice if I jump down to an example, this backlight example here, uh, <clears throat> then because uh, we're we're a backlight is a consumer, so that the person asks a question uh, about uh, another example of provider and consumer would be an actual PWM driver, like this enhanced PWM is a provider, right? And then say a backlight driver might is, is say a consumer, right, of, the, of a PWM resource. Uh, and so um, if we look at all of this uh, information about the PWM specifier, what we're trying to do is say, how do I specify the red, green, and blue PWM so I can control them, say, in a driver, right? Maybe I've got an RGB backlight, right? Um, so, <clears throat> so their example is PWMs equals, you know, ampersand PWM, that's a P handle, right? And it's PWM, the, the zero one, right, um, within that. Uh, and then uh, uh, this, the, the next value is the period, uh, and then there's some flags. Uh, so the, um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on the, the flags part uh, and so forth, uh, uh, but there's, there's, it's very clear in the third cell that that just inverts it. Um, so you would either use that value uh, to invert or not. Uh, so that's what the, the binding looks like that we're trying to use. So this is very similar to how we specified the GPIO buttons or IIO I, I channels, right, for an analog digital controller. Now, to specify what PWMs, we would we would um, uh, describe them this way. So we at least know, at least in hardware terms, the channels, right? Also, if I want to know more, <clears throat> I would go to the TIER ehrpwm.txt. I'm in the BeagleBoard. You can actually see my uh, branch here. So that's BeagleBoard 414. Um, so that's their downstream production kernel. Um, so if we look at the actual provider driver or provider um, device tree binding, right, for this specific SOC, um, they uh, they point out uh, how these nodes are described, right? So, okay, uh, I know I'm going to find some EH, EHR PWM uh, nodes when I look at my DTS for this platform. So, all right, I learned a little bit about bindings. So why don't I just go down and look at the DTS 32-bit platform, right? So um, I'm going to go right into the DTSI. Um, and look at that. OK. So there's, so there's these EHR PWM. Now, they're not right adjacent to each other. Um, 
but you'll see there's EHR PWM zero, right? And there was EHR PWM one, these instances. Now we could look at that, this register value, 4830200, and we can trace that back to the memory map and confirm that, oh yeah, that's, that's PWM zero, right? Um, but typically it's one to one. I'm gonna tell you it is, right? Uh, and uh, so the end result uh, is that when we wrote down, uh, so when we wrote down uh, the fact that uh, P133, uh, P133, um, red is PWM zero B. As I do this live and try to make a lot of errors, um, P two dot one, right, was um, green, and that's uh, PWM one A. Uh, and then P136 six is blue, and we figured out that was PWM zero A, right? So what we can what we can derive from that from then looking at our TRM, looking at those bindings, and then looking at the AM33XX is that um, the the uh, the node we want to, or the P handle, right, is zero. That's going to correspond to PWM zero. Remember, we look at the, the TRM and it's saying that A and B are just channels on that. So our specifier, so if I had red, and this is kind of pseudo-coded. That's all I want you guys to understand how to get at the data and translate it. So I take that back um, and do it like this. So blue is EHR PWM zero, zero, and you know, maybe it's this period, it doesn't matter. And I'll just put zero for that flag. Um, let's not worry about cells two and three here. Uh, but just kind of pseudo-coded, um, you see, whoops, uh, we'll do them in order here, sort of. And then um, finally, green, remember, if it's PWM1, then we have that other instance we saw in the DTSI file. And this is channel A, so that's going to be zero. So that would kind of be essentially pseudocode of uh, how to specify uh, each of those PWMs, right, as a as a property. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, see if there's any other questions here. Or I think we are just about out of time. So I uh, appreciate everybody coming. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties today. I hope uh, uh, hope it was helpful to you. Um, as always, if, if you didn't get the slides, they're there. Um, and uh, uh, I'll be around the, on Slack uh, through the end of the conference. If you have any questions, um, be happy to uh, discuss this further. Um,
um, and help anybody through the labs and, and any any side questions I didn't didn't answer. It's sometimes easier on Slack to do that. Mm -hmm. 